Farewell, Eric Ten Hag, in your day's doomed Dutch bald little wizard head. Let go this morning by Manchester United after a measly four wins from 13 games to start this new season. No one's sadder to hear this news, no doubt, than anyone who doesn't support Manchester United. <sighs> They wanted them to stay forever. For those fans, it's been a schadenfreude-filled delight to watch United flounder. I'll be honest, I've actually found it at times humanly hard to watch Ten Hag kind of twist there in the wind at Old Trafford with his repressed suffering. Clearly no longer a man in control, more the living embodiment of the this is fine meme sitting by his coffee cup in a room as it burned down around him. In this video, I want to reflect why this decision was made now. I mean, United both interviewed everybody for Ten Hag's job this summer, which must have destabilised the poor ball bloke to no end, then handed him an extended contract. Talk about mixed messages. And we'll also discuss what now for United. Where do they go from here? Um, as that managerial carousel spins once again in this ongoing chaos era, 11 years and counting now uh, of disappointment and decay since Sir Alex Ferguson left. The real question is, what, if anything, can Manchester United do to stop the rot? Let's start with this morning's news. United's new controlling owners, Ineos, under Sir Jim Ratcliffe, briefed the press that they'd lost faith that the 54-year-old Dutchman could turn things around. 11 points from nine league games. Manchester United marooned in 14th place will do that, to be honest. They're seven points off the Champions League already after nearly a quarter of a season. Let's just say the already concerns United are too far adrift to qualify for the top four. But let's be honest, losing 2-1 to West Ham United will do that to a manager. When you're not even the best United in the Premier League, or I guess when West Ham are not the worst United, I mean, not to get too Diane Keaton on your asses, but something's got to give. Especially after that summer of spending $232 million dollars lumped on five players um, and you could see it up full time at the weekend after Jared Bowen had scored that late late quite cruelly awarded penalty uh, Lopetegui howled with relief then marched over to a quite shell shot looking Ten Hag Van Nisselrooy Look at this, because if you want to go and see it, we posted it on our Instagram at the time. Um, the second we saw it, I mean, it was like a mini movie, to be candid. Ruud van Nisseroy couldn't even look at Ten Hag at the final whistle. He just suddenly pivoted on the ball of his foot and span away. And you kind of knew, you kind of knew just then, looking at it, that the sound of the tectonic plates underneath Old Trafford were grinding away. By the way, that Jared Bowen penalty, a 90-second minute strike of agony... Uh, Opta put out a stat this morning, quite damning stat, that seven of Ten Hag's 26 Premier League defeats came in the 90th minute or later, uh, which is the highest percentage of defeat for any manager who's lost 20 or more games in Premier League history. Remember, this is Manchester United, the 90th minute onwards, that is hallowed time. In the great days of Manchester United, that was Fergie time when Sir Alex Ferguson knew somehow, some way, his team of winners just knew how to get business done. 26% of the losses Ten Hag experienced were in that period. He did exactly the opposite. His team, they killed over and self-soiled over and over again with the world watching. So for Ten Hag... Today's decision, honestly, humanly, when you think about it, it must have been some kind of a relief. This has honestly felt inevitable. The moment the manager started his war with the English media, in which he used every post-match press conference to essentially deny basic facts about what our very eyes had seen on the field. He would proclaimed progress and unity and cohesion when we'd all just seen exactly the opposite live out on the field. Let's just put it this way. No manager declares war with the English media and survives. It is the death rattle of anybody's tenure, the beginning of the end. And the truth is, Ten Hag had since last season had that consumed, defeated doom look in his eye. We've seen it before so many times at Old Trafford, that gaunt dead man stare of David Moyes, that confused, how is this happening to me, agony that Louis van Gaal experienced. Even Jose Mourinho was undone by the court intrigue of Old Trafford. We're on him in a moment. Um, but poor old Gunnar Solskjaer, so loyal, so beaten, beaten from within 
The same with once proud Ralph Rangnick and now Ten Hag, uh, a man who also began so confidently uh, but was ground down by the maze of realities at Old Trafford. Um, Watching him this campaign was honestly like watching Ned Stark flounder in season one of Game of Thrones, a gent who also ended up with his head on the block screaming, I'm a Northman, I belong here with you, not down south in that rat's nest they call the capital. Yes, Remember this too, Ten Hag did deliver trophies, the Carabao Cup and the FA Cup. He returned United to the Champions League, but the whole time, the number of problems he had to solve from the very beginning felt like an asteroid field, falling out with Ronaldo, with Jadon Sancho, Anthony Martial, Marcus Rashford and so on and so on. But let us also remember, it all started so well that first season. Marcus Rashford, this did happen. Scored 30 goals, seemed light and free. Bruno taking on the captain's armband. Lissandro Martinez playing at the bat like a giant, even at just five foot nine inches tall. United were third in the Premier League. They had all you could drink, Carabao Cups, but then... The darkness, the unsolvable injury crisis, the the drop in performance. Well, we'll get to the question of who next for United. We should ask, whose fault was this latest debacle at the managerial level? Was it on Ten Hag? Was it the owners, the Glazers, and then the new controlling minority owners, Ineos under Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who who brought in a much hyped front office, high-performance team of advisors, And all they seem to have done is just sit on there, grim-faced, from the Manchester United box, looking on almost like the Kremlin leadership after disaster after disaster unfurled below. Reality is, they're not blameless. I mean, first of all, poor Eric Ten Hag had to lead to the chaos of that protracted sale of the club, which created uncertainty, dead duck leadership, um, and chaos on the transfer market. I mean, if you were an elite player... Put it this way, or an agent of an elite player, would you want to risk paratrooping into that madness? Then there was the bungle reality of the Ineos takeover, in which they interviewed quite publicly what felt like every single available elite manager and their mother uh, somehow couldn't land their man uh, because of timing or contractual demands. Um, and then they decided, you know what, we'll belatedly back Ten Hag. They flung money at his transfer wilms late in the window and even gave him a contract extension. I mean, the ineptitude of these actions to first undercut the manager and then support him with an asterisk. How do you seriously expect that same man to walk into a locker room and be respected? How do you expect him to lead when you have diminished his authority to such an extent. Honestly, I thought about poor Ten Hag uh, this summer, and every time I've seen him on the sideline um, during this season, he's almost seemed like a cartoon character who was having the floorboards in like Tom and Jerry cut from under him with a saw cutting a perfect circle that he would just, boom, plummet through and disappear. So on one level, it wasn't his fault, but in football, as in life, Two things can be true. The ownership can be inept or naive. Uh, But Ten Hag was also very much to blame in the role of his own demise, the tactical unwillingness to solve that giant hole in the midfield that everyone could see. Was that inability or was that stubbornness? The the fast attacking style that he tried to employ with players who could not press, the midfield that couldn't cover, the defence constantly caught out of shape, utterly vulnerable over and over in turn to quick breaks from opponents. And then those post-match press conferences of just oh, attempted stoic agony. Um, honestly felt like briefings from a failed politician, just the madness of the transfer decisions alongside, which made a mockery of, uh, of being a, a strategic scouting recruitment data analysis uh, planning uh, kind of organisation. Seven of the 23 signings made by Ten Hag when he was at United had already played for him at previous clubs. And amidst all of this madness, the English media, the drumbeat, so many of them Manchester United old boys, every word 
unleashed a thousand tweets um adding fire starters to an already burning inferno so much talk of turning a corner after a single win um of a club lurching back into crisis after one loss united always seemingly said to be just one player away from turning it round one transfer window away constantly the dream was just a crock of gold at the end of a rainbow so how do you defang this stasis um, this action, this noise disguised as forward progress, uh, in which the club has honestly become a buzzsaw for talent, a reputation shredding carousel uh, for any uh, right minded manager, um, and essentially a mid level team that can be undone with, uh, by any club uh, who have a plan, a vision, and the ability to execute it. What now really depends on how you analyse the nature of this problem. And I will get to possible successes who are being rumoured in one minute. But here's how I see United's biggest challenge. Because I do think the failure, and it is cultural at this point, in the same way as Manchester United's winning uh, was once cultural, the failure is systemic. It's no longer about individual managers. A bit like Arsenal before Mikel Arteta. Um, United appear to be a structure that has failed. Um, so while you hope the manager will change everything, that an Ugarte can come in and solve the problems on the field, it disregards the reality that modern football is about systems and cultures and United's culture is like no other in the world because... The beginning of the Premier League, United, their strength was they were the first club, the first movers to realise that the Premier League had changed English football from where a reality in which the clubs were, were local entities into ones in which they were suddenly global billboards. Um, and they made the team, essentially refashioned it into a global ATM, printing cash, oodles of it, uh, by turning it the club into a commercial juggernaut, a club with an official airline uh, in every continent, an official vehicle, uh, an official beer partner, even a potato chip snack and an official tractor engine in every quadrant of the world, which is amazing uh, in many regards. But it also means this, that United have to, having constructed this commercial monster, they have to feed it by creating news, creating noise at the local, at the national, at the global levels. Every day, noise. A reality which left the ultimate control freak, Jose Mourinho. I said I'd get back to him. When he left, he was very honest about his analysis of his own failure. This must have been very humbling for him. He muttered about his inability to run the club. He actually doubted anybody's ability to run the club when the football department was always second and subservient to the decision-making and needs of the commercial team. And until that changes, United will not change. If you think about that, as you start to debate who should replace Ten Hag, because for now it is Ruud van Nistelrooy on a, quote, temporary basis. He's a gent who didn't exactly light the world on fire in his short spell at PSV Eindhoven. Uh, he left amidst complaints from the players about his training methods and his coaching, which sounds familiar. By the way, English tabloids already um, reporting problems between <laughs> Ruud van Nistelrooy and the Dutch players in his squad. Look, United fans, um, you could have had Thomas Tuchel. This summer, he was interviewed, was seen as the most viable replacement. Now, England's national team manager, Mauricio Pochettino, rides with us, the United States manager. So there's a lot of hype right now about young genius Ruben Amorim. But what I would say is this, ultimately... None of this matters. A manager alone is not going to change anything at Manchester United. Um, and I know, I know United fans, more than probably any other club, is a place where you want to revere the manager. That's uh, probably why uh, Ten Hag had as much time as you gave him, uh, because the fan culture is born of an era when the club's patriarchs, true great, Sir Matt Busby, manager for quarter of a century, and then to Alex Ferguson, uh, were the driving forces, the singular forces who propelled the club into the greatest in the world. But modern football is not just about one man. It's about alignment between owners, board, front office, manager and squad. United is right now the opposite of that. And the irony is they have spent a fortune on the club and spending money normally guarantees success. But... Spend the money without a plan, without a vision, 
without a long-term plan, without a long-term vision, without a long-term ability to execute, well, anything is the same thing as taking all that money, putting it in a garbage can and setting it on fire. And, well, that is what Manchester United have been. That meme of the dog with the coffee and the room on fire. This is fine when it's obviously not fine. But, and here's the good news, Manchester United fans, you look at Arteta at Arsenal, transforming the culture, overhauling the squad, creating seismic change. Look at Unai Emery at Aston Villa, who's done it even quicker. Maresca at Chelsea, glimmers of green shoots. Look at that. That will tell you what is possible to change, to transform, and let glory, glory Manchester United rise again.